The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us in the little postcard epistle of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Athia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, after our long sojourn in the Pauline letters to Corinth, uh, we now turn our attention over the next two Sundays Uh, to the little letter of Paul to Philemon. Uh, That will be followed by five weeks in the wonderful minor prophet book, Haggai, uh, after which we'll take uh, two weeks in the little postcard epistle of Jude uh, as we launch into our fall. Uh, But today, we're going to focus on Paul's letter to Philemon, one of, really and truly, one of my favorite books in the New Testament. I love this book for a host of reasons. It's personal, it's uh, focused, it declares the gospel with great clarity, and it lays out our responsibilities before a watching world with power and suasion. So let's pray that the Lord would really open up this book to us Uh, this morning and next Sunday. Father, we're grateful for your word, uh, which is inerrant, uh, infallible, and effectual uh, for the work of grace in our lives. Uh, Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in it, for we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Four Loves, wrote... Language is not an infallible guide, but it contains, with all of its defects, a good deal of stored insight and experience. So if you begin by flouting it, it has a way of avenging itself uh, later on. We had better not follow Humpty Dumpty in making words mean whatever we please. Humpty Dumpty, of course, is the familiar character from uh, nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all the king's horses and all the king's men (laughs) couldn't put Humpty together again. It's an incredibly powerful metaphor, isn't it? Some falls are so great that even kings and princes, with the wide array of resources around them, cannot put it together again. It's part of the reason why this, uh, this metaphor is used so often in literature. Uh, James Joyce's uh, Finnegan's Wake, Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men, uh, even uh, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward's uh, Expose of Watergate, all the president's men draw on Humpty's great fall. In Through the Looking Glass, Lewis Carroll's 1871 sequel to Alice in Wonderland, Humpty and Alice 
have a conversation about etymology and epistemology, however unlikely that might seem. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful term, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. No, Uh, the question is, said Humpty, which is to be master, me or the words? Alice was too puzzled to say anything. So after a minute, Humpty began again. You know, they've got a temper. Some of them, particularly verbs, they're the proudest. Adjectives, you can do whatever you wish with them, but not verbs. You have to take them in hand, but I can manage the whole lot of them. That's what I say. It seems that politicians and lawyers, school teachers and Hollywood actresses are playing Humpty Dumpty with our language. And they want words to mean whatever they intend for them to mean. Uh, Particularly a victim of this Humpty Dumpty uh, sort of semantics is the word love. You've heard it bandied about to mean almost anything. Yesterday, I had the a great privilege of performing a wedding ceremony. And I I reminded everyone that it is God who defines the world. Uh, God who defines what marriage is. God who defines uh, what love is. So we can have yard signs all day long that say love is love or love is enough or love never judges or love is my favorite drug. And it still doesn't change anything. In a sense, the Apostle Paul wants to define love for the beloved disciples in the Lycus Valley. The churches in the Lycus Valley were relatively obscure congregations in three relatively obscure towns scattered along the edge of a relatively obscure river, about 100 miles east of the thriving city of Ephesus. The three towns, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, were well off the beaten path in the Roman province of Pergian Asia. Hierapolis uh, was well known for its thermal springs, a place where people went to restore their health. Colossae, about 25 miles to the southeast, sat at the foot of Mount Cadmus and was the beneficiary of cold spring water and snowmelt runoff. Laodicea sat right between the two cities. As a result, the Lycus River flowing through Laodicea with the thermal springs on one side and the cold snowmelt on the other was forever neither hot nor cold, but merely lukewarm. It appears that the Apostle Paul never actually visited the towns, though the gospel came there through his influence while he was ministering in Ephesus. Even the letters that he wrote uh, to the Lycus Valley congregations while he was in prison seemed to have been something of an afterthought, just an addendum to the packet of letters he intended for the more prominent Ephesian, Philippian, and Thessalonian churches. Despite all of that, though, the Lord has used those uh, little, uh, often overlooked flocks all across the ages ever since all out of proportion to what men and women in the first century might have expected, their legacy has become one of the most recognizable and influential in the whole of history. Part of the reason was because of their partnership with the Apostle Paul. They were incredibly generous 
Again, all out of proportion to their means. Uh, But part of uh, the reason was uh, the large number of dynamic disciples and early church leaders that came from that obscure little valley or ministered there. Philemon himself was a prominent leader in the city of Colossae, an early convert of the Apostle Paul, according to verse 19 of Philemon. He had served in ministry with him as a fellow worker, according to verse 1, and he was the host of the church there, which met in their house. He and his wife, Apphia, had a son, Archippus, who was apparently the pastor of the church, or perhaps had been sent out as a church planter in nearby Laodicea, a ministry that the Apostle Paul admonished him to fulfill at the end of the book of Colossians. Tychicus was originally from Ephesus, according to Acts 20, but he may also have spent a good deal of time there in the valley as a trusted member of the Apostle Paul's missionary team, according to 1 Corinthians 16. He was dispatched to deliver the letters of Paul to Ephesus, Colossae, and to Philemon, according to Colossians 4 and Ephesians 4, and he provided support for Titus and Timothy later on in their ministries, according to Titus chapter 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. Epaphras uh, was from Colossae, uh, and uh, we're told that he had a, a zeal uh, for the people there in the Lycus Valley, uh, according to Colossians 4, uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, one of Paul's most trusted servants. Uh, and then there was Onesimus. He was a runaway servant the, who was providentially converted under the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and then he returned home at the risk of everything to the home that he'd absconded with uh, many apparently valuable things, but now he comes as a beloved brother in Christ. Paul uh, commends Onesimus in his letter uh, to the Colossians, and here again in Philemon. In Colossians chapter 4, he's identified as one of the brothers sent uh, with Tychicus, Uh, to visit the Christians in Colossae. Later, according to Ignatius of Antioch, Onesimus was ordained and served as the pastor of the church in Ephesus after Timothy had ended his ministry there. And then, uh, during the reign of the Roman emperor Domitian uh, and the persecution of Trajan, Onesimus was martyred. Uh, first imprisoned in Rome, and then stoned to death. So the letters that were sent to Laodicea, Hierapolis, uh, and uh, Colossae uh, form a really important part of the personal story of the Apostle Paul while he was imprisoned for the gospel. In uh, verses 1 through 3 of Philemon, we have Paul's uh, regular inscription. It's typically Pauline. It's warm, it's pastoral, it's encouraging. Uh, But notice, he identifies himself as a prisoner. Not of Caesar, not of Felix, not of Agrippa, but in the good providence of God, he was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice, too, the gospel saturation of this inscription. Philemon is a beloved fellow servant, a fellow worker. Aphia is a sister. Archippus is a fellow soldier. He bids them all grace and peace, the grace and peace that comes from the Father and the Lord Jesus. In verse 4, he follows his, uh, his inscription Uh, with thanksgiving and pastoral care. He says that he remembers them in their prayer, in his prayers. 
and he does so with thanksgiving. Spurgeon says of this passage, Jesus saves and Paul prays. That's the picture of a pastor. In verse 5, uh, he says that uh, this thanksgiving is because he hears of Philemon's love. That his love and his faith, the faith that he has toward the Lord Jesus and all the saints. This is actually a poetic chiasm. It's uh, given here for emphasis. Essentially what Paul is saying is, I give thanks uh, because that your faith in Jesus has resulted in love for the saints. In a sense, this is the thesis that he will drive the whole rest of the letter on. And then in verse 6, he says uh, that uh, he is praying very specifically. Uh, Paul's prayers are not generic. Instead, he is praying that the sharing of Philemon's faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, what's interesting here is uh, the translation of the word sharing. In the King James, it's communication. Uh, you, would, uh, you would get a sense that what Paul is saying is, now, when you go out and witness, I'm praying that your witness of your faith uh, may be effectual for the, the knowledge of every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. But actually, the word that's used there is koinonia. It literally means a fellowship. Paul is saying, I, I, I want to remind you that faith in Jesus always manifests itself tangibly, manifestly in love. So he's saying, Uh, that the love that you have for one another, the fellowship that you have in faith, this will abound to the full knowledge of every good thing that we have in us for the sake of Jesus. He's saying, if you're in Christ, this changes everything. It changes all of your relationships. It changes the way you approach the world. It marks you with love. And so Paul then says in verse 7, because of this, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. Because this fellowship has been made manifest. He says, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you. So he says in verse 8, and this is where he's getting to the point of the letter, accordingly, or therefore, or in light of all of this, I am bold enough in Christ, literally, I have full assurance, and I have full authority in the name of Christ to command you. to enjoin you, to order you to do what is required, to do what is right, to do what is obvious, to do what is meet, to do what is fit, to do what is proper given this love that has so marked you. Your faith in the Lord Jesus has produced this kind of love. So he says in verse 9, but, or yet, for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Unfortunately, in our English translations, there's one word that is left out. In the Greek, there is a definite article right before the word love here in verse 9. 
In other words, this should literally be translated, yet for this love's sake. Yet for the love's sake. Yet for this particular love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. This a peculiar love is a love that is different from all other loves. Paul's already defined it. He's defined it as gospel love. You probably know that there are four Greek words uh, for love that are used in the New Testament. There is storge, which is a familial affection. Uh, This is uh, used in the New Testament in a negative fashion. Uh, In Romans 1 and in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if we are devoid of familial love, uh, that is a mark of reprobation and utter depravity. Uh, The second Greek word is philia. This is the bond of friendship. Uh, This is what James is talking about in James chapter 4 when he says... uh, Uh, Do not be friends with the world. Instead, in Romans chapter 12, uh, we are to love with filial love and brotherly affection. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, uh, this brotherly love, this philia is to continue among us. The third Greek word is eros. Uh, This is romantic love. It's the love between a husband and a wife. This is the, uh, the love that stirs the heart, that causes uh, the heart to go pitter-patter at the very sight of him or her. Uh, in the Septuagint, this word is used in the Song of Solomon, chapters 1 and 7, eight times. But the word that is used four times in Philemon is agape. It is a a kind of selfless, unconditional love. In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis says, this is the only love that is not natural. We can't conjure it up. But we can't make this happen. It actually only comes to us as a gift of grace. This is divine charity. This is the love that we read of in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the love of John 13.34. You are to recognize this. I have given you a new commandment. Love one another with the love that you have received from above. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16. Uh, Let all that you do be done in agape love. 1 Corinthians 13. Agape love is patient and it is kind. It, uh, It bears all things and it believes all things and it hopes all things and it endures all things. Agape love never fails. See what Paul is saying here? He's saying to Philemon, I don't have to order you. I don't have to command you. This love that has marked you out, he uses it in verses 1, 5, 7, and again here in verse 9. This love has so utterly and completely changed you because you are in the love of of Christ. He's saying, look, this love is produced by faith in the Lord Jesus, verse 5. This love is therefore directed at all the saints, verse 5. This love produces koinonia. It quickens the knowledge of every good thing in Christ Jesus in that, that, that is that are uh, Those things that are now in us, verse 6. This agape love bestows joy and comfort, verse 7. It refreshes the hearts of the saints, verse 7. And it quickens us to obedience, verse 9. It hushes the law's loud thunder, 
his commands become our happy choice. This is why the Apostle Paul was able to say to the Corinthians uh, that uh, because of the love of Christ, uh, this now controls us. Uh, We have concluded this, uh, that for Uh, that one has died for all, therefore all of us who are in Christ have died. He died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. See what Paul is saying here? He's saying there's a radical transformation. Where... An unnatural grace comes upon us when we are in Christ that enables us to love people who are not like us at all, who come from the ends of the earth, who have peculiar habits, a peculiar way of of, of living, of speaking, of, of conducting themselves. And yet because of this unnatural love, poured out upon us, we share in the fellowship of that love. And it then quickens in us a knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying here is the gospel changes everything. He says, who we are shapes what we do. So if we are in Christ, then we must love one another. And not only that, but we must Bear that mark before a watching world. Francis Schaeffer, in his uh, brilliant uh, declaration, uh, the church at the end of the 20th century, very prophetically and presciently, saw all the woes of our day, the coming of our Humpty Dumpty semantics. And he said, notice That what Jesus says in John 13 is not a description of a fact that can be tested by science or defined by judges. It is a command which includes a condition. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also Love one another. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Bible tells us that judgment begins at the house of God. When a culture goes awry, whose fault is it? The culture's or ours? Paul is saying, be the church. The gospel is true. Christ has redeemed you. You've been snatched away from the flickering flames of perdition. You've been set free. And this freedom now leads you to love in such a manifest fashion that it becomes proof to the world. No more Humpty Dumpty definitions. We bear the banner of love because we know the love of the one who came for us. This is the heart and soul of Paul's message to Philemon and to us. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.